imagine a world where the automation revolution has arrived. Robots have completely replaced humans as the workforce, ushering in an abundance-based utopia. In this world of plenty, people no longer have to fear of what tomorrow brings. Now, everybody can rejoice in leisure, the pursuit of happiness, and self-betterment. Seems promising. Right. But that's not exactly how it all turned out. At some point, we've realized that we cannot pull off this utopia on a global scale. We lack the resources. Maintaining our robotic workforce consumes too much of our resource and energy output. And supplying the demand for the endless consumer products and services depletes our resources, our fossil fuels, and further degrades our environment. Thus, automation actually became scarce, not ubiquitous. Universal basic income didn't turn out to be as universal as it sounds. Many people around the globe started migrating to find better worlds, to find better homes, to find hope. Therefore, those regions of the world that could not automate and could not provide for its inhabitants face depopulation and collapse. And although there might be some, let's say, anar anarchic communes that live off the land, but actually most of those lands are desolate. And some are even ruled by ruthless warlords who employ slavery and child labor because they are seen as cheaper than robots and their infrastructure. This was supposed to be a next step for the whole humanity, but it didn't came to its promise because it was flawed from the beginning. When we were thinking about creating a better life here on Earth, we forgot about the bigger picture. We forgot about space. Now, when we think about the space, what first comes to mind are the stars, planets, and the cold, infinite void. But often we forget that we aren't merely some outsiders looking in, but are in fact passengers inhabiting a biosphere of a space-faring planet. This is how it looks from far away. A pale blue dot. It is here on this dot. This is a picture taken from the Voyager. Here is where all our wars, all our lives, and our economic activity is taking place. And nearly all of human activities are dependent on harnessing the resources of our little home world. Now, let us actually look at the dimensions in which our political, economic, and social thinking is operating. Here's a geopolitical map. Maps, maps like these are basis for making crucial decisions. They help us indicate national broad borders, the transfer of wealth, world trade, and even the, the deposits of resources both on land and on the bottom of the ocean. And this is uh, by using just uh, this two-dimensional picture that we are building our awareness and our knowledge of the world that surrounds us and also our worldview, a strictly geocentric worldview, which is dominated by the either or mentality, where we have to choose between development, 
in peace. A world in which dreams of space exploration, overcoming illness, defeating aging, and even defeating death by transhumanist technologies tend to hit artificial walls. These walls are what constitutes a closed world, which forces us to think of it as a zero-sum game, where, and it is also susceptible to limits to growth. Our resources are scarce and limited. Most of them are non-renewable, and harnessing them damages the environment. But let us look at a different map. Oh, sorry. Let us look at a different map. As you may see, our world, as in the words of Kraft Erike, is no more close within its biosphere than it is flat. Our main source of energy is this star right here. It's, one of us, if it's also one of the reasons we're actually alive. Our sun produces approximately 385 yottawatts of energy. That's 20 trillion times the annual energy consumption of the whole human civilization. And only a fraction of this energy even gets past Earth's atmosphere. You must also remember that we are made of star stuff, as Carl Sagan put it. Our planet is also star stuff and its resources. Therefore, whether we go and mine the moon or the asteroids, gas giants or comets, we find an abundance of resources, although in different flavors and compositions metals, minerals, hydrocarbons, isotopes, and volatiles also. In the ancient times, or maybe not that ancient, but in the old times, our maps used to describe uncharted areas with the phrase, there be dragons. Now, you can see that beyond our home world, there be no dragons. There are only flying mountains, stellar objects, and worlds awaiting us and our progeny. But, let's just say that also space gives us solar wind, microgravity, gives us uh, <coughs> various ranges of temperatures, radiation, and a high-quality vacuum, all of which have enormous industrial applications. Now, we see that our spaceship Earth is surrounded by forces and resources which can change the economic and social paradigm of the whole humanity. <laughs> but, having a, but having our eyes and mind and brains glued to the ground, we cannot develop what astronaut Edgar Mitchell referred to as the global consciousness. We are unable to see beyond our gravity well and view all the surrounding possibilities, possibilities to generate power and beam it down without damaging the environment, possibilities to not only create better wo worlds, but, but also expand our biosphere to other globes or creating orbital habitats. Now, we have to remember that we have to gather our party before venturing forth, and that is not easy. Currently, members of the United States can seem to draw a consensus on both the legality and the framework for space mining. Some states follow a free-for-all approach, according to which they pass national laws allowing their own citizens to mine, to use, 
and trade space resources on a free market. Well, not everybody agrees with that. There are also states who would uh, like to see taxes levied on space miners. According, according to this doctrine of the common heritage of mankind, these taxes have a purpose of sharing the benefit of space mining with the whole world, with every state and every citizen, but with a special regard for those in the developing countries. Well, actually, none of the current major spacefaring nation is part of a treaty which establishes this common heritage uh, principle because they see it both as a cat in a bag and also an idea so undercooked that you can still invite it to dinner. There are also other approaches. For example, creating new trees, creating new options, and also even going beyond the UN treaty system. Like, for example, creating an intergovernmental agreement, like the one that uh, governs activities on board the International Space Station. But beyond beautiful initiatives, the activities of states are mostly uncoordinated and sometimes even at, at odds with each other. What limits us here is the mental gravity well. We know how to overcome Earth's physical gravity well, for example, using rockets, but the mental gravity well is still a challenge to us. It is our geocentric uh, viewpoint which makes us uh, think of our world as the center of the universe and everything beyond it uh, just, uh, as just a big ball of fire and some lights on the blue vault of the sky. Well, we have to remember, we've evolved to live on the bottom of the gravity well, so that seems natural to us. But it's time to change our Flatlanders perspective. We need to dare to discuss and draw plans to use those space resources in order to make life better on Earth and beyond it. We need to actually get <coughs> away from what we see as this geocentric perspective and turn the center of gravity for the human condition from this geocentric perspective to an interplanetary, polyglobal perspective. And yes, some of you may ask, why should we even throw money at some rocks in a vacuum? Of course, or so even uh, we can say that at when, we have to, uh, <coughs> when we actually do space investments, why can't we just expand our satellite systems? Well, they bring, bring profit and they, are, and they are very helpful. The problem is, well, I'll tell you a secret, a secret. You see, the satellite industry actually faced the same doubt and same disbelief prior to the launch of the first Earth satellite. These were seen mostly as musings of Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov, and, uh, and others. Today, we know that satellites help us to, have <coughs> to create a better connected world Earth observation he helps us also to look down to Earth, but from an orbital perspective. Helps us manage our agriculture, resource or, uh, <coughs> extraction, and also helps us plan the fight against climate change. So what we must dare is to create those plans is to overcome our two-dimensionality in order to in order to in order to actually go and release ourselves from the upcoming civilizational cat catastrophe. There are no limits to growth in a three-dimensional space. Those limits are only made by bending the knee 
to the mental gravity. And we must dare, because there is only one way to go from here. And that way is outward. <laughs>